Okay, everybody. Uh, my name is John Allen. <clears throat> I'll be the moderator for this session. It's great to see everybody here on this uh, Tuesday afternoon or Tuesday morning if you're out west. Um, um, welcome to Professional Development in Integrating Technology for Settlement and Language Training. This session, as I just said, is a precursor to the longer session that will be had at TESOL Ontario in uh, October of this year. Doctors Phil Hubbard and Greg Kessler have been leading international lights in the world of technology-enhanced language learning for many years. From their academic positions at Stanford University and Ohio University, respectively, they have each contributed as teacher trainers and authors to the theory and practice of online and blended language training. New Language Solutions is very pleased to offer this opportunity for Canadian settlement and language training professionals to gain from Phil and Greg's insights and to get to better places. In this webinar, Greg will start by discussing innovative uses of technology for student engagement. And Phil will be then taking a deeper dive into listening in the digital age, drawing from research and practice, along with examples from his Stanford listening and vocabulary course. Teachers will be introduced to tools and strategies to help their students work effectively with online listening experiences outside of the class and will be provided with a link to the Stanford course notes for further exploration. Okay, Dr. Kessler, please start us off with a talk about innovative uses for student engagement. All right, so hello everyone. Um, I am going to share my, my screen. Hopefully you're seeing that. And hopefully it's uh, in presentation mode now, yeah? Yes. So um, it's very nice to, to be here. I'm, I've been looking forward to this uh, webinar and also to our, our more extended talks that we're going to be doing um, this fall at um, TESOL Ontario and Alberta TESOL as well. Um, so the title of my portion is Designing Innovative Learning Experiences. And um, I'm going to begin by uh, talking about the, the, the fact that, you know, everything these days has been influenced by the pandemic, of course, right? And and a lot of the, the ways that we've reflected on using technology in, in education have um, have actually really, I think, benefited a lot from the pandemic. It's um, it, it has changed things so that absolutely every instructor in the world has some kind of experience teaching online, whereas I um, struggled for decades trying to get my colleagues to teach online at all. And so I think um, a lot of the things that we have, have learned to do during the pandemic are also more effective during um, normal times as well. So I'm going to be talking about a number of, of these things. I, I want us to rethink the way that we um, we think about instruction. So the way that we focus our instruction, the effectiveness of it, the authenticity of the materials and the experiences and the um, spaces that we use for instruction and, um, and the potential. I, I think that we can always be striving to um, to make our instruction or the ed learning experiences, as I like to refer to, um, as as meaningful and uh, and um, effective as possible. I think there are always ways that we can tweak things, that we can add, we can enhance things to make them a little bit better. So I, I'm constantly thinking about that and how um, even the minor um, design aspects can make a big difference. I'm going to be talking about creating compelling and engaging experiences in order to maintain connections between people, harness cognitive surplus, promote participatory culture, and again, strive for this authenticity. I think it's critical in language, um, in language learning and language practice. Some of the examples of engaging pedagogy um, that I'll be sharing with you um, include a variety of uses of social media. Um, I, I think it's very obvious that, that social media is very common. Um, and, it's ubiquitous around the world. And in fact, there's data showing that the growth rate of social media use is increasing around the planet at about 10% every year. So it, we're getting to a point where virtually everybody is going to be on social media. So um, I think that's really interesting. And while a lot of it can be pretty toxic and, um, and a difficult place to exist, I think um, it can really be used effectively for language um, learning experiences. And um, I'll share some examples of that. 
We've got a variety of mashups, um, some fan culture, gaming, gamification, and game culture, digital stories, uh, virtual tourism, augmented reality, mapping, and data aggregators, uh, community engagement, and all of these things can be used to teach a number of um, topics as well as um, language practice, but I think we can always strive for social justice. Um, I'm going to be showing you a, a few pictures of collaborative kind of group work learning spaces that we might be familiar with in person, in face-to-face -face context. And I think um, these aren't the same. These are very different environments depending on the level of the students, the age of the students, the, the kind of purpose of the class, um, how they're working together. This is a kind of a typical um, a learning space in, in the United States and in, in universities these days. You've got a lot of uh, desks that are mobile. Students can be in clusters and they can, they can use these boards to share things. They have um, their own devices that they can use in small groups. It's a very flexible space. Um, I think there are even more varieties of online learning experiences than I will be showing you for these face-to-face -face things. And um, yet I think a lot of us think about you know, online learning as being kind of monolithic, like it happens in one way. And, um, you know, you you use Blackboard or you use whatever learning management system there is, and it's really often just far too lecture driven, so not, not student centered. So here's a different um, collaborative group workspace. So different kinds of students in a different part of the world, but they're able to be working with each other. And you, you can see that quite a different space, another different space. Um, and so these are, younger learners. And although these are somewhat similar, they're still quite different. Students are sitting, they're not standing. Here they're able to, to move around a lot more. Here they're going to be, um, you know, a little more stationary. So just like I said, I think we have so many different ways that we can design in-person, face-to-face learning experiences, but there are multitudes of more options in online learning. So I want to share some examples with you. This is an online tutoring um, environment that we have been using for a number of years. In fact, this um, I think this is from a decade ago, this screenshot. And so it's using Google, Google tools. So we have a, a writing laboratory where we have um, graduate students who teach international students um, to uh, improve their, their writing in English. And so traditionally they would meet face-to-face -face in a shared space and they would pass paper back and forth. Um, but we, we did this just to make it more convenient so students didn't have to travel across campus. Now, when you have something like a pandemic, it, it makes it um, much more useful no matter where you are in the world. So here you see that you've got video. So there's a live video chat session happening between the, the tutor and the student. They've got their text chat as well. They've got the document that they can mark up and they, they can share comments and feedback on. And all of this is being recorded so that when the student leaves the session, they can go and refer to the video and be reminded of the important um, aspects that they, they need to address, right? Whereas in the past, in a traditional face-to-face -face model, they're, all they have when they leave is whatever they remember or whatever's written on the paper. So I think this is much more uh, beneficial in some ways. Here's another example. This is a telecollaborative exchange. This um, is between our students in the US who are learning Japanese and our students in Japan who are learning English. And they have this um, key part, key pal partnership. Instead of writing emails to each other, or you know, traditionally they would be writing letters and sending them through the post. Um, here they are going out and recording video of their daily activity. So this picture is right outside of a student's apartment building, and the tag on the map is where where that is. So they're able to share their daily experience with each other, and you get to see another side of the world. So you kind of feel like you're there, which I think I think is a great thing. And this is a a concept that I'm going to be referring to numerous times throughout this talk. Um, this is a, a, a map. It's a Google map, very easy to make. Um, students can make these to share information about a variety of different topics. It could be historical things. It could be um, about important people from a target culture. Um, this happens to be a map of places that I have given invited talks like, like this one. And um, I created this initially just for my own use. And I had been using these maps a lot in education. So, um, so I, I just like to share this because it, it, is, it is extremely simple um, that, you know, children are creating these and you can create these to make things like scavenger hunt games or, or other kinds of very interactive activities. 
And you can zoom into the level where you can even have a large building separated into different areas. So you can send people to different places to get information and, um, and, and go from one place to another based on that, those cues. This is a similar kind of um, experience. This is a, an app called Tailblazer. It is a free um, app. In fact, everything that I'm talking about is free. I really like that word. Um, and I think teachers like that word a lot. This is a, a, a tool for creating mobile um, games. So I've got some codes here that you, you can use to um, explore some games that my students have made in a class that I teach. But these are education mobile play based games. This is a, a picture a, of, a, of a student who is in the land laboratory at an elementary school near my house. Um, where we made this game. And um, so as you're going through this game, you're identifying trees and plants and um, and the uh, creek and animals that are in the creek and other things like this. And um, in order to progress through the game, you have to ne negotiate with your partners and answer questions as you walk through um, the land laboratory. And um, this, as you enter this, there is actually a voice-based device welcoming you when you approach the bridge. And it says, you know, welcome to the land lab. And it gives you your first uh, clue for the first thing that you have to find. Now, I, I think that the, um, the internet itself is a really fascinating topic for discussions and writing and all kinds of other language prompts. And so this is, um, this is one artifact um, or something yeah, I sometimes refer to as digital realia. So it is a, an image from the internet that can be used to talk about a variety of different things. I mean, I think it's, it's fascinating that in one minute on the internet every day, there are 240,000 photos shared on Facebook, right? So what does that say about us? What does that mean? Why, why are people doing this? What, you know, what's the motivation? And you've got all these other, you know, emerging technologies that many of these wouldn't have existed 10 years ago. So I think even that itself is a really fascinating um, topic. There's some themes I want to touch on. Uh, we have diverse social um, and language practices. We have a diversity of learning environments. We have improved learning design. We have um, artificial intelligence and automation, augmented reality, data and learning analytics, ongoing assessment, and the potential for individualized learning. And all of this is leading to something called the Internet of Things, and I think the future of assessment. Um, so I'm gonna to be touching on all of this very quickly um, with some examples. And so with artificial intelligence and automation, I'm sure you've encountered this in, in your own lives, but maybe not in the classroom, but there are numerous things happening already, and there are a lot of developments on the horizon. Uh, we have natural language processing, automated linguistic analysis, translation tools, automated speech functions, automated writing evaluation, and bots, including robots and cobots. Um, a lot of work right now is being done by Google and their, their AI um, team, which is really an interesting um, place that is actually beginning to focus on education. Whereas in the past, they, they created a lot of tools for us that we in the education sector borrowed and used in education, but they weren't necessarily intended for education. So um, we have voice assistants, like this is the Google Home. Um, I, I like this picture a lot because I think of these devices as being a teacher's assistant. So the students can be in, engaged in some activity and while they're doing whatever it is that they're doing, they don't have to stop the activity and the flow of the activity. You know, there's a lot of work these days about flow in education and how interrupting flow when people are really engaged in doing things can really just kill the entire um, experience. So here, they don't have to open up a device to get information if they need some facts or some details, some data. They can simply ask and say, you know, Tell me what is the capital of Canada, for example, if that's what they're looking for, right? So um, that's a great way of um, using a device like this. And these kind of devices um, allow you to create your own customized apps for them. In fact, I teach a class um, every other year where students learn to develop these kind of apps using tools like this, which is Get Storyline. And um, it allows you to make these interactive voice controlled um, experiences. 
But the thing that I'm most excited about is this last um, section here um, about virtual shared space as a shared context for learning. So we have shared physical instructional space. Now that's those classrooms I showed you earlier. These are, you know, we are in the same physical space and it's a space intended for learning, right? We have shared online instructional space, which is it's like this, like Zoom. So we are sharing this space and it's online. It's designed for instruction. We have authentic virtual space. So this would be a, um, if we are meeting here and um, somehow we are transported so that we feel like we are in the same authentic space together. So for example, we could be in, um, in Stanley Park in Vancouver, right? And we, if we had pictures behind us or video um, behind us that we all shared that were, was in the same place in Stanley Park or any, any other place you have a picture or a video, then you can feel like you are immersed in that space together. And I'll be showing you an example of that in a minute. We have simulated virtual space. So this is um, space that is, um, it's creating opportunities to interact with the space as well as just feel like you are immersed in it. Then we have artificial virtual space, which is space that um, isn't really real, right? It could be, um, it could be Hogwarts. It could be something from a work of fiction. It could be um, something that is from a fantasy, um, from any, any sort of kind of um, artificial environment. We have game spaces and we have some other shared spaces. So I'm gonna take a, a quick walkthrough of this. And um, this is um, something we call the holodeck. It's a, this picture is from 2009. Sorry, I have to close my door. I hear people coming in down the hallway. Um, so this, is, this was quite a while ago when I got started working with these kind of shared immersive uh, virtual spaces. And all we did in this, in this situation was put three projectors in a room connected to one computer and you can project something onto all three walls that is one continuous image, right? And so this happens to be Google Street View inside of Manhattan. So you are able to walk down the streets of Manhattan where there happens to be a lot of language, primarily English, but there is other language as well. And um, everything you see in front of you and everything you see in your peripheral vision is an environment that you share with others in this, um, this space albeit a limited small space, but this has extended into My lots of other My name is Lance Teasley. I'm in middle school in Eagle Grove, Iowa. Eagle Grove is not a very tall place. It's actually very flat. This is the tallest building on Main Street. It is about 50 feet tall. When I grew up, I wanted to be an architect and design skyscrapers. Yesterday at school, we went on a class trip, but this was not a normal trip with buses. This was something very different. The very first expedition we went on was to the Burj Khalifa. Go ahead and grab two hands and put them up to your face. It's so tall. Okay, we're going to go to the 153rd floor. Okay, so this is um, Google Expeditions, which is a, a project by Google that has, um, has been killed. It's no longer with us, but there are numerous other um, brands of this that have, off, that have been uh, created from this since it died. And many of the materials are still available through a, a new project called Google Arts and um, Culture. And so this takes the experience of virtual reality, which immerses you in this, um, this 360 degree virtual space, but you're not doing it as a, an activity all alone in isolation like most VR experiences are. Instead, you're doing it as a group and somebody in the group is leading the others. And I think this is a fantastic way to be able to take people into all kinds of different environments. And then this, this is Google Earth um, 360, which has thousands of different um, immersive 360 degree VR experiences all around the world. So there are all kinds of opportunities for this. Um, I'm, I'm sharing a handful of these, but there are many more. This is, um, this is ancient Rome built completely inside of Minecraft. And you can navigate this on your own or you can use videos like this where someone else is navigating it for you, but you get to be inside of this space. Now, 
Minecraft ha happens to be a fantastic environment for doing a lot of constructivist learning. Um, there are so many opportunities for students to interact with each other while they also interact with the environment because in Minecraft, every, every participant is building the environment as well as um, the, you know, destroying the environment if they want it. That's part of the experience, which in fact is something that we have done in some cases. Um, and there are extensive projects on here. It, it's been at least a decade since the entire country of Denmark was on Minecraft. Um, so it's pretty amazing. There are websites like this. There are so many resources out there that I think um, people don't realize, but you can explore again in this uh, virtual reality 360 degree view, the Great Barrier Reef with David Attenborough, right? Um, and you don't have to have VR goggles. You can be looking at this right on a computer, although the experience is not quite as meaningful. Um, you can go swimming with sharks in a safe way. Um, or you can do things like this. I put together this video using Zoom and putting different pictures and different videos behind me just to illustrate how, how simple this can be because you can do this and send the pictures or video to your students and have them put this up and then you have this shared space that you can make. So I will um, just play this very quickly. I could be in a kelp forest. I could be on Mars. I could be in front of the building where I teach, hanging out with Bernie. I could be in Minecraft, traveling through the city of Los Angeles. I could be in a classroom with a group of children. I could be wandering through virtual Pompeii. So this example of Pompeii is um, one that I chose because I was actually, I was there in 2018. And prior to going, I found this 360 degree tour that allowed me to visit Pompeii before going there in person. And it felt like I was, it felt like I had been there. The footage of Mars is from the Mars Pathfinder. And so this is a 360 degree virtual reality experience on the planet Mars. I, I don't know how many of you are gonna be able to take your students to Mars in person, but we can do it in these virtual um, spaces we can go to the Louvre and we can go to the British Museum um, called the, you know, the, they also call it the Museum of the World because it's looted from everywhere in the world. Um, Google has these collections of, of special cultural um, experiences as well. And so this is um, one example of these is a tour of jazz clubs around the world. And it, this is just one example. There are all kinds of different things. And, um, they also have, as part of the arts and culture, they, they have thousands of different um, collections from ev basically every country in the world, including a number from Canada that I'm sure would be useful for you with your students. So this is a, 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 an immersive tour of the National Gallery. Now, if we think about this from a slightly different perspective, though, there are also experiences where instead of immersing yourself in this environment, you're able to take an object or um, some, some physical thing and dissect it and separate it and break it into its components like the human body for teaching anatomy. This happens to be uh, an app that is used for teaching anatomy in Chinese. So the last thing that I'll be talking about is the Internet of Things, which you've probably heard this term. Um, and this is basically where the Internet will be like we treat the electrical grid today and everything will be connected with um, the internet. So we can link a variety of devices, including digital assistants, projectors and screens, cameras and lecture capture systems, learning management systems, RFID chips and wearables, sensors, and anticipated to soon be the internet of everything. So in the internet of things teaching landscape, and, and I think every teaching landscape, the center of all activity, of all thinking about this is the teacher. And, and you can see in this situation that the teacher is providing um, the student with information, the students interacting with that, data is collected from the student's performance, and then things are refined as we go through this cycle over and over again. And in the internet, the smart internet of things schools, um, we have things like this. We, we have chips or wearable devices or, um, or maybe even just our phones 
where as soon as students walk in the room, their attendance is taken. So you don't have to waste time by taking attendance. I have seen classrooms in some parts of the world where attendance takes a long, long time and somebody comes in late and the teacher stops everything and goes back to taking attendance. And that's just one example. There are many different things you can see here. And all of this leads to um, using this data to individualize learning because that makes it's learning more powerful. It, it's adaptive. Um, we can pace content appropriately. We can assess students more effectively and less painfully. And we can use assessments to customize future learning and create learner models. And that looks something like this. So every student has a slightly different pathway through the learning experience, but they all end up successful on the other end, hopefully. And this is my, my last slide. It's a quote from something that I wrote last year. All teachers need to be prepared for the increasingly technology-driven future. And these as these digital spaces diversify, they promote different kinds of language production. This evolution presents limitless potential for language learning experiences, and this potential will only be realized by those who understand these opportunities. With that, thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Kessler. That uh, gives us so much to think about. It's uh, overwhelming, but uh, exciting. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what the questions are at the end of uh, Dr. Hubbard's uh, session. And uh, over to you, Dr. Hubbard, to discuss teaching listening in the digital age. Great. Thanks, John. Um, and thank you, Greg. As always, uh, makes me wish I was back in school taking some of your classes. Um, I'm going to move from the uh, amazing future uh, and even some of the immediate present to something you could do in class tomorrow, potentially, and dealing with uh, an area that does not receive a lot of respect in my experience, and that is listening. So um, let me just go ahead and jump in. Hello, Canada from California. So we do live in this marvelous uh, digital age and it's, it's kind of a golden age and Greg has just given us a really good set of reasons why that's true. It is a great time to be a teacher. It's also a very challenging time to be a teacher though because putting all this stuff together and trying to figure out how to make your own classes work better and help your learners achieve what their goals are uh, requires sorting through an awful lot of things and maybe learning a lot before you get there. So I'm going to take us back, as I said, to, uh, I'm going to change my view here so that I'm a little bit better set up. So I'm going to talk about listening. And we can start by saying, okay, why listening? Listening is really important for language learning. It's something since the, the 1970s that's been built into uh, a lot of the second language acquisitions uh, theories and research that we use listening as a channel for bringing language in. And in uh, recent decades, an awful lot of listening has really focused on interaction. And I think listening through interaction is great. It's important. But we also need to be able to listen one way, to be able to listen uh, to uh, videos, to be able to listen to talks like this one. There's also an important link to vocabulary development in listening. Vocabulary is often taught and learned through text, and that's okay until the, the language learner is trying to pick up that word or phrase they've learned in connected speech. And so there needs to be a listening dimension to that as well, and not just one where the word is, is isolated in a dictionary form for sound. What's really been amazing to me during my career, because um, I've been interested in listening for the last 30 years or so, is going from audio cassette tapes to now all of these free online resources. 
And Greg mentioned authenticity as being important. What's important now is that these resources are no longer just available to teachers. They don't just come with textbooks. They're out there for everyone. And a lot of language use takes place uh, for a lot of people through listening and listening and watching because quite often it's video rather than, uh, than just audio. The expansion of access is important. And of course, the, the presence of these digital comprehension supports. And that's something I'm gonna talk about uh, quite a bit in the little time we have here. Often, because they're called comprehension supports, and you probably already have an idea what I'm talking about, things like captions, for example, they're seen as just ways to access meaning, but they can also be important tools for language learning. So before I go on, I want to step back a bit and talk about three different types of listening activities or three different goals for listening activities. And this is true whether you're working in class, but it's also something I think increasingly we want our students to be able to do on their own. Um, in my setting, I had students for a maximum of 10 weeks and then sent them on their way. And I wanted them to be able to continue working on their own to take what they learned, not only in terms of uh, new vocabulary and built up listening skill, but also in terms of the strategies and the reasons for using those strategies to continue improving on their own and doing it in an engaging way with uh, video material that they were independently interested in. So one way and the way we, I think, think about the most is to improve comprehension. You want listening activities to help students get better at learning, to help them interpret more deeply, uh, not just get surface facts, but also be able to make critical judgments about what they hear, to be able to retain important elements of it, and integrate content that comes through that's important to them uh, so that it connects to what they already know. Another area, and this is one I think that uh, doesn't get enough attention, is to improve language processing. We know that automaticity is important in, in language listening and speaking, as it is actually in reading and to maybe a lesser extent in writing. So the faster you can process an incoming speech stream and get the meaning out of it, the more cognitive resources you have for doing other things, especially in an interactive situation. We also want accuracy. Um, it's easy for uh, learners, I think, to get stuck in a fairly uh, lexical-based processing pattern where they are picking out key words and they're missing this connection, for example, between you know, whether they're hearing a past or a present tense. And then there's capacity. How much language information can you take in at one time? Is it just two or three words? Is it half a dozen? Uh, we know that there's this process called chunking where you're not really processing word by word, but in phrases, uh, in groups of words, uh, as, that are familiar and doing that as a single unit. And building that kind of capacity is something that can be done as well. Finally, going back to the more mundane areas maybe of language learning, it's, it's language knowledge, phonological knowledge, being aware of things like the way that linking works in English uh, so that when words are connected, part of one word gets attached to another or syllables or uh, get uh, reduced and so on. Certainly lexical knowledge is the big and most obvious one uh, and the one that I think has the most traction with the students. And then grammatical knowledge. If you think of grammar as only something that exists for the written language, uh, you're missing out. It's out there in the spoken language and it can be different. And then of course, discourse knowledge, understanding how um, how a lecture, how a news report uh, tends to unfold. These things go through, uh, through scripts of sorts or the discourse uh, knowledge of a typical everyday conversation with a, um, 
uh, in a transactional setting, say at a restaurant. So when I say knowledge here, I mean actually some conscious awareness of these things, not just having acquired them through experience. Okay, I'm going to jump into a quick uh, YouTube video because YouTube is something that's widely accessible, uh, at, at least in, in the countries we're in. And it is a, a really good repository and a, a place where students can get to things. You can use them in class and you can also have students do them at home and get them working in areas that are interesting to them uh, on their own. So a typical listening uh, task that you might see in a, uh, in a textbook would be, okay, you do some pre-listening, you read the title, the description, then you listen through, taking some notes, maybe reflecting. Um, I mean, here that this isn't followed by a quiz or something like that, but that it's actually just how you can interact on your own with a, with a video text. These are good for comprehension and for getting the content, but we can use this kind of activity to better support that language processing and uh, language learning, the knowledge elements, uh, better than we do now. So I'm going to jump to this example and go through a list of comprehension supports. I will have a link to my notes, uh, my slides here at the end. So we'll just listen for it turns a out that multitasking is a myth. We think that we're doing a whole bunch of things at once, but we're not actually because the brain doesn't work that. Okay, so we know that there's a play button over here in this corner. There's, is this being shared by the way? Is everyone seeing this? Yes? Yes, 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 yes you are. Good. Yeah. Somehow the little green screen around it disappeared. So, okay, so you're getting this, good. Um, so in this video, I could have started at the beginning here where it says, I know you probably can't read that, but it says multitasking is a myth and an attempt and to attempt it comes at a neurological cost. Watch this video uh, for more information. So, you know a little bit about what this is about we're listening to it. I have paused it. You can pause it by clicking on the pause and play button. You can also do it with a space bar, which is a lot handier. Um, you can use the slider to move forward and back. Oops, sorry. Use the slider to move forward and back in the video. All these things you know. What you may not know, and what's really important uh, potentially for uh, language learning, just for comprehension, and also to be able to focus on the form a little better, is that Earl Miller's lab at as you're playing, if you want to go back quickly, you can hold the shift key down and hit the back arrow and it will jump back about four to five seconds like this. MIT and others that what we're really doing is we're paying attention to from Earl Miller's lab at MIT and others that what we're really doing is we're paying attention uh, from Earl Miller's lab at MIT. Okay, so if you didn't know that, that's something not only should you know as a teacher, it's something your students should know. Shift back arrow for a jump back because that what you just heard is still active in your working memory. And this has to do again with what Greg said about flow. It doesn't interrupt the flow in the same way that using the slider and trying to find the right spot does. Now we all know about captions and you can turn the captions on to this. Um, and that you not only have captions, but if you go to the settings buttons, you can go to uh, a translation. And so if we pick I guess this being Canada, I'll pick French. Then you get that. And again, this is relatively in, instantaneously and thinking about how you can toggle this on and off rather than just doing it for the whole video. Uh, the more you use these, just like keyboarding or playing a piano, the better you get at making these moves. Um, I will dump the captions for the moment. There is uh, also, and this is again important 
for language processing, the ability to control the playback speed. Um, for a long time, uh, YouTube only did this as by cutting the speed by 50%, which is way too slow. 75% gives you something which is more- MIT and others that what we're really doing is we're paying attention more to one thing for a little bit of time and then another and then another and then we come other than the fact that he might put you to sleep you know it's uh it's good for giving a little more processing time and then recently besides this there's now a custom button up here right by where that k and big think is and it allows you to do it in five percent increments. There is research that suggests that somewhere around 80 to 85 percent is a good speed to slow down to without making it sound artificial. So that target was not available uh, until recently. Okay, uh, what else? It turns out you not only have um, captions, but you also have a transcript. So over here on the side, you can see the transcript. And this is what's referred to as a smart transcript where you can click on a section and it will and go to that section. And you end up fractionating section. your attention into little bits and pieces, not really engaging fully in any one thing. All that switching. Let me take him back to normal speed here. And it turns out you can do some interesting things once you have a transcript. I don't necessarily recommend using the transcript during the normal play because then you're not really looking at the video, you're missing, you're, you're splitting your attention. There's a cognitive theory of multimedia that explains why it's a better idea to use captions or subtitles than, than to look at the transcript while it's being played. But um, once you have that transcript, you can do things um, like uh, you can somewhere here is the, it's actually being, hmm. anyway, you, there's a button that's currently hidden from me. Let me move this over, maybe. Yeah, there it is. There's a button up here that lets you to toggle the timestamps off. You can then, if you want, oops, copy. Actually, I normally go to the bottom of the transcript and copy from the bottom up. If it is doing what it's supposed to do. And once you have the transcript copied, you can go to this really interesting uh, Canadian website called the Complete Lexical Tutor. You can put that transcript into the, this is called the Vocabulary Profiler, and it will go through and tell you at what vocabulary level all of the words are. So for example, here uh, in this yellow are the words that are at the 3000 level. So actually between the 2001 and 3000 level. So relatively common words like evolution, cycle, uh, chemicals, and so on. It can help you as a teacher and help learners if they're working on their own to decide what words are most useful to pick up. If you've got words down here, frivolous, for example, shows up at the 8,000 word level, that's a nice word, but you're not going to come across it nearly as often as these other words. And uh, fractionating, again, you're not going to come across that often. So uh, if we go back here. So this is the screen that has all of that information on it if you're interested. I've only got, I think, about five minutes left, so let me move on. 
there are a bunch of challenges associated with doing this, with bringing listening into your classroom to a larger extent, and especially with trying to get students to do more listening on their own in, in much the same way we would do with extensive reading for reading. You have to be able uh, to know how it fits into your class. You need to find appropriate uh, digital resources. You need to not only identify, but also learn your, for yourself these technologies so that you can help make sure your students know how to uh, use them as well. And then ideally put together effective tasks and so on and train the learners to be able to do that as well if you want them to be able to work outside of class. Um, I have a little piece on learner training. This has been an area I've been interested in for at least 20 years when I discovered that even students in my computer science uh, department, international students, uh, did not know a lot about how to use technology in ways that really helped them with language learning. So uh, if you look up this paper or if you want to send it to me, uh, or send me an email or something, I will be happy to give you a link to the paper on learner training. But it essentially says we've got a lot of research that shows that students need help in doing this and is simply expecting the technology to do everything. Um, you'll, you'll end up maybe having a, an interesting, fun, engaging experience for the students, but they won't necessarily uh, achieve very much in terms of the learning goals. If you're selecting resources either for your own classwork or trying again to help uh, have students select resources, it needs to be number one interesting. And the better you know your students, the better you're going to be able to pick something like that for your own classes. And the better they know themselves, uh, the more likely they are. If it's not interesting, if they're not motivated to get into it, then it's, uh, it's not going to happen except to the extent that you can get them to focus attention. There's evidence that if they work in an area that's already familiar to them, it's better material for improving their language learning and their listening skill. Something that is conceptually new at the same time you have something that is linguistically, has some linguistic novelty to it, uh, it's too much work for the brain. So letting them work in areas that they already know is helpful. Uh, making sure the material has text support, even though we're focusing on listening, if you can't isolate words and phrases, uh, it's going to be very difficult to pick those things up. Not impossible, but it's inefficient. And then correctly leveled material, I just gave you an example there. Um, if you expect your students to know the first 2,000 words of, um, of English, then you can look for material where at least 95% of the, the words are at that first 2,000 word level, and you can use the vocabulary profiler to do that. Um, I'm mostly going to let you explore my listening class if you're interested in it. Um, this is the course that I taught until uh, I think my last one was spring of 2020. And this is a link, uh, which again, I uh, will be in the notes here in the slides. The goal of it is to help non-native speaking graduate students both improve, but also prepare for learning independently. It met for 10 weeks, two hours a week. But importantly, this, the students had their own independent projects, so they would pick an area they were interested in and on their own or often with some help from me, select materials that would be useful for them. And then they would work on those materials, not just listening for context and comprehension, but also trying to pick up new vocabulary and do some of these activities that would help them uh, work on processing. One of the things I did both in class and outside is go back to uh, to doing dictations. But the goal there is not to get, you know, spelling and punctuation and everything right. It's to see if they can actually pick up the words that are being spoken, uh, get the grammatical information that's embedded in there, and to the degree that they can't be aware of what it is they're missing, 
so that they can start working on that. Um, this is what my first class unit looks like. It's the, the theme of it is Nikola Tesla, and it starts with a, an introduction to Tesla, and then I do the class introduction and move on from there. You can see I use a lot of uh, YouTube videos, but I also use Vimeo and TED Talks and others. So there's quite a bit of information. This is just one of the 10 weeks that you'll find in those class notes. Okay, to sign off here, so there's a little bit of time for questions at the end. My point here is uh, to just re-emphasize that listening, and especially this one-way listening, rather than expecting it always to be interactive, it's an important skill. It deserves much more emphasis than it typically gets. Um, there is now a seemingly limitless collection of listening content available. And teachers and learners need to be good at selecting useful ones. Often it's not a problem finding something that's interesting, but finding something interesting that it's, is at a level that's going to help support your language learning is tough. Um, there's this amazing array of digital tools that I haven't, uh, I haven't gotten to all of them. I actually missed one of them, which is uh, if you're uh, within a, uh, a browser in that transcript, if you double click on a word, if you're in uh, Windows and Chrome, or if you two finger click using uh, a Macintosh, you can get a pop-up definition. Again, no break in the flow the way it would be if you had to even open up an electronic dictionary to get that information. So for more detail uh, and uh, more of, uh, of Greg's thrilling ideas as well, come to our workshops at the Alberta Tesla or Tesla Ontario conferences. I'll leave that up for just a moment um, and we'll try and get it into the chat as well. The slides from my talk are already up with all their links. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Dr. Hubbard, for all of us. Uh, we, I'm sure that all of us have learned something about listening, especially with the enhanced technology that uh, you've introduced and a lot of us are experiencing, and as well, the seemingly unlimited choice options of materials. But thank you very much for your generosity by sharing your uh, expertise and your resources over the years, both of you. So I, I would like to just start um, um, by opening it up, the questions up for Dr. Hubbard's se listening session. Um, Elizabeth asked Dr. Hubbard, um, she notices that you're using YouTube Premium. Are all of these features you're describing available on normal YouTube? That's a very interesting question. I. I've gotten so used to it. My son uh, got a family plan for uh, for YouTube uh, Music, and YouTube Premium came along. So uh, it's a good question. Um, I will explore that between now and the conferences. But if for some reason everything is not available, uh, whatever fraction of those you can find, you're still going to have a, a good example. So the um, I'm reasonably sure that the you know the the speed control and so on are there. I don't know why the transcript wouldn't. As far as I can tell, one of the main YouTube premium points is that you don't get the advertisements, and that's why I like it. Uh, why I kind of right. have it on by by default. Um, so maybe yes. someone else knows. Um, does any if anybody has else has another question for uh, Dr. Hubbard? Could you raise your hand and then if we recognize you, then you can uh, speak mute your mic or unmute your microphone and speak? Or did he do such a good job that everything was crystal clear? Yeah, I suspect there was, a, a, again, a lot thrown at, uh, at folks there that it's more important to decide whether it's interesting enough to pursue it. And that's why, um, you know, I want to make sure the slides and such are available. Uh, what I'll do if there end up being questions for Greg is I will go test that YouTube question on another browser and where I don't have premium set up and see what happens and then get back to that questioner before. Oh, the end. excellent. That, that sounds great. 
Okay. Uh, there was one stream of questions for uh, Dr. Kessler, and that was from Bonnie. Bonnie, I'm sure you're still here. Would you like to ask those questions directly to, to Dr. Kessler? I did just answer all of those in text. Yeah, is it possible to maybe discuss those so all of us, uh, some of us can't read very well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Bonnie, are you, uh, are you open to this or do you want me to read the questions? Okay, so question number one was, uh, what's, what is a, or will be the impact of the technolog technological innovation on here. the workload for teachers? Here she is. I'm, I'm here. Any Click predictions? Hi, Bonnie. I will shut up. Hi. That's okay. Go, Go ahead. ahead. And, and Greg did answer them in, in the chat, so I appreciate that. That, that one, that, that is um, probably the most interesting one, I think, that first question. Um, I mean, they're all very interesting, actually. They're, they're you know, right on target for kind of the most important questions. Um, but that first one, I mean, I, I have found the more that I use technology, the less work I have to do. I think up front, there's a, there's a, a steep learning curve, right? Or there used to be. I should preface this by the fact that like when I began using technology as a language teacher, you kind of couldn't do very much unless you were programming things. We don't have to do that today. It's things are so easy that even what I refer to as a sharp learning curve means spending a few minutes with something before you bring it into class. It's not really that difficult. I mean, the, the things we are accustomed to using in our daily lives um, are very similar. And that's, you know, I, that's what I try to focus on it's the same kind of skills that we use in order to stay in touch with our family members and our friends and to navigate our way through our you know, daily experiences and such, right? Um, but the workload thing is really interesting. I, so I, I think the more that you invest, the more that you create technology-based materials, the less work you have. But there is that upfront investment. Um, yep. And I think... More than that, changing the amount of workload, it changes the nature of the workload so that I can offload, as I wrote in the chat, I mean, I, I can elaborate a little bit. I can, I can offload some of the things that are really tedious as a teacher, like constantly correcting the same grammar errors, right? Stuff like that can be done with some automated tools. So then I can focus on things that are much more interesting and can benefit much more from, you know, my, my human awareness as a tr as a, a well prepared teacher who knows how to interact with learners and i and how to um ask you know unique questions instead of just doing that that kind of drill and kill stuff um so i i think it changes the nature so that maybe in some ways it makes our jobs a lot more interesting can can i just add one thing um yeah in in the sort of the the last 10 years or so, the, the teaching market for in, in Canada, I'll just talk to Canada. Uh, a lot of us have been jumping from job to job uh, with uncertainty. We can't get, some of us are not unionized. And if I was in a union and I know that security, but I jumped out of it. I don't know what I was thinking, but uh, anyway, the thing is, is that for my jobs, I like in the last uh, two years, I've had five positions, five different uh, jobs. And every single time I, I, I take up a teaching task or development task, I'm developing fresh new stuff, right? So I think uh, what you're saying, uh, Dr. Kessler, is that if you have a sort of a semi-permanent position and your managers are not jumping you, moving you from different courses like chess pieces, uh, mm -hmm. you that is so true. You can really set up a, a nice pathway and teach and recycle and reuse and repurpose those uh, learning objects and have a great time, I believe. Sorry, that's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think even if you're changing, I mean, if, you're, if your position is not changing dramatically, um, it's, it's easy to take things that you've created for one environment and um, change it, right? So that it fits another environment. And I think, um, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm still using things that I created a long, many years, well over a decade ago, but I, they're constantly evolving, you know? Um, I mean, I'm probably using things that I created over 20 years ago that are still constantly evolving. 
Um, and that saves a that it saves a lot of time. That's true. Bonnie, do you want to ask the next question? Um, yeah, and I'll just make a comment there that most of us, I suspect, in this um, webinar today work in the settlement language sector, and we have already an intense workload here in Canada. And so when we add something, you know, the question has to be what, are, what is being taken away, and often it's nothing. So I do find some, some resistance to technology among colleagues, even among colleagues who taught online largely for the last two years of the pandemic. Um, so. Um, Greg, I'm not sure if you want to pick a question because I, I think, do we end at three, John? Oh, which is right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll just say thank you so much for answering my questions in the chat, Greg. And oh. thanks again to both of you for a great, great presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I, I do have the answer to the question, which is uh, you don't need YouTube premium. Um, so if I can really quickly share. Yeah, I, I use transcriptions all the time. So I know and I don't have premium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if over here, you can even get you can get the transcript. Um, so this is in um, this is in Safari. And so if you want. Uh, so here we go. I'll use the the uh, pop up for the this is the pop-up for the dictionary. So that way you can, if you just use a two finger click on the on a Mac, then you get the pop-up dictionary and thesaurus and so on um, out of this transcript. Okay. Uh, stop sharing. Yeah, I, I... Again, I don't pay for YouTube, and I so I do. I, it is the ads, and it's also downloading. But there are websites and other tools that I use to download <laughs> YouTube videos all the time. So, so it's possible to do that without paying. Mm Okay, well, um, it was a pleasure uh, getting a chance to chat with folks virtually about this. Again, it would be great if, uh, if you can make it to one of our uh, workshops, which will cover some of the same material, um, but in a more leisurely uh, fashion and, and with a more interactive kind of, uh, of setup. At least that's the plan. Okay, folks, thanks, uh, Dr. Hubbard. Uh, that will be Thursday from 4.30 to 6 p.m. on October 27th. The title is PD and Integrating Technology for Settlement and Language Training. Uh, Dr. Kessler and Dr. Hubbard will be joined by Robert McBride for that session. So we're all looking forward. We're all big fans of Tesla Ontario here at New Language Solutions, and we're really looking forward to that event. Thank you for coming and sharing your expertise. And everybody, thank you for sharing your Tuesday with us. Hope I hope the rest of the week goes well. Thanks. Thank you. I just put my a link to my slides in the in the chat as well. I saw some. Oh yeah, and I will do that uh, right before. Hopefully, uh, this gets signed off. I'll I'll wait for that. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, it shouldn't yeah. take long. Thank you, everybody. Excellent. Thanks, okay, Dr. Harper. Somebody might double check if that works. Yeah, it's it's there. Thank you very much. That'll be recorded bye -bye. and be placed near the video. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Have a great have a great day, everybody.